reached the, the, the bottom, uh, the, 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 the stops, the levels where he wants to go, and if you're the last one to get out, you're, it's a quite, could be quite frustrating, quite a long ride. And it's actually quite impressive. I mean, in China, people get now, I mean, they have like, when they come too late to work, for the third time, they get fired. So you can imagine how much, what's happening you know, in big, tall skyscrapers. Uh, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning at the lobby, people want to like start, they start running up because they want to get too late. And this is due to, you know, these conditions. So it's a really serious problem as well. And then with Schindler, um, they, they are actually the first ones who implemented this idea of a destination control system. So before you get into the cabin, you tell the system where you want to go and the elevator kind of groups you uh, according to your destination. So everybody gets in, that's a, you know, of course, very idealistic, but everybody's super happy because it's a kind of, a, you know, it's highly, you know, sophisticated algorithms that calculate, you know, these, the, the, the shortest ways for everybody. And that's an interesting paradox because you think if you ask everybody in the room, it's like, okay, where do you want to go? If somebody wants to, huh? you know, it's get chaos. But, you know, through these technologies, you know, and these algorithms, we actually can, you know, we can, you know, increase the system intelligence, we can increase the system efficiency as well. And of course, most importantly, the experience for the user. So this concept on the right, this idea of this destination control, uh, we want to take from a, from a vertical stack in, 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 in skyscrapers and take this to an organization horizontally laid out as neighborhoods. Um, so think of your destination in a level now as a neighborhood in a city and then group people accordingly to the same destination they have, and through optimi optim in the uh, optimum condition in the uh, above ground and underground routes, transfer routes, bring them to, the, to their uh, common neighborhood and then distribute them for the last local mile. So as I said, we want to activate also you know, three-dimensionally the spaces that are there already, and we did this example for Berlin Subway tunnels, tunnels we have, um, and if you think about tunnels, I mean, this is like the most um, expensive infrastructure you could think of, and it's, it's, most of the time it's empty, nothing happens there. People, you know, sometimes there's a subway coming through, but most of the time nothing happens there. And Elon Musk came up with this, it's called the Boring Company. <laughs> boring. But... Uh, no, he actually, I think he released this video like, you know, two weeks ago um, saying like we should, we should have more tunnels and bring cars down, you know, into these tunnels and have like multiple levels. I think, I think it's, it will, we have the same gridlock that we are experiencing today on one level, we just have the same thing, you know, on, on the other level. So I'm not so sure about this idea that you put a Tesla down there. I think we have to reinvent this thing that goes down there, basically. And that was what we tried to do with... Um, with uh, the designers from Audi. Um, and we looked at the, you know, the functional architecture of a car. Basically, you have the powertrain in the front, you have the cabin for most of the time four people, and then you have the door. Um, the designers who worked with us, they said like, you know, door is, a, is, is such a painful moment because they've designed this beautiful uh, object and then somebody cuts in the door, basically. So it's a really painful moment for them. I think the door should be like an integral part of the system it should actually be the entire vehicle, should be a door, basically. So what we said, let's first of all shrink this uh, vehicle down to one-seater, and you know, say the whole perimeter becomes a door now, and then have this powertrain that's a decoupled peripheral powertrain, and so loosely bring them together, and so this is the kind of uh, smallest unit of this, this uh, kind of collective mobility concept, it's called flywheel, basically. Um, as I said, this door could actually is, is actually the most important part because now it can couple with other units. So from a one-seater, it could grow into a two-seater and so on uh, in both sides. And the interior is now, oh, is it, yeah, there it is. So you have now you have this, the most of the space you have now in front of you instead of behind of yourself. Um, and then it can also turn into a logistic mode for transporting goods. Uh, because it, of course, works autonomously, you don't have to drive it. Um, and because this is kind of loosely coupled, you actually won't experience going up and down so much anymore. It's like a kind of gravity 
uh, responsive interior, basically. And you know, this is, as a one-seater, it basically could become a, you know, a personal assistant to also to an aging society right now. And as a two-seater, we could say it turns into a dating app, maybe a Tinder on the go or something. Or as a you know, multiple-seater, it could become a guitar concert, maybe on the go or something like that. Or whatever, but we said like, you know, it should be a, kind of the, the iTunes of the mobility sector, so like an open platform for the sharing economy. People could actually you know, come up with different business uh, solutions based on this, uh, this mobility concept. Has to be designed, of course. The guys from Audi made it look quite beautiful, maybe, or not. You have to decide for yourself. <laughs> and then uh, this would be like a, just a video now, you know, showing how the experience, how we'd go now to take a to, to take your uh, to take yourself home with this kind of home button basically uh, it's now literally available so you uh, the, you would order this flywheel um, it you would sum it in basically it comes picks you up and then you would uh, ride home smoothly silent electric right silent I mean the noise of the city imagine like think about how noisy and, and, and annoying they can be and how beautiful it is electric. Um, so then dive into the tunnels. Now we turn into the kind of you know, transfer route mode and uh, we can actually use the electricity down there to charge on the go, which is there already. So then we couple with other people who apparently have the same destination like us. So because now we share the same destination, it's actually the chance to meet our neighbor on the way home is much higher. Sorry, <laughs> you have to have it, or you have to like it, or not. But I think you know, we have to, we have to, you know, we have to force people to, to talk more again. Like we have to enable, you know, communication rather than like disabling it. But I mean, um, so this would be kind of a illustration sushi sushi subway, right? <laughs> um, and these people now. So they seem to have a different direction. They want to go somewhere else now. So okay, bye bye. They take off. Oh no, we arrived. Yes, we go. We we arrived now to our kind of uh, destination neighborhood um, and turn back into the local mode. And we we're together with our neighbor. Right now it's two two flywheels together. And oh, this is really bad resolution. But okay. Um, this is now the kind of this mobility landscape that can also grow on, 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 on into the third dimension at the top. So um, the idea like this, yeah, this was a Berlin street before, just as a reminder, yeah, this how we look in the future, of course. Uh, but the idea really is to say, can we, can we multiply public space through these mobility concepts? You know, this is maybe the biggest unit, this flywheel, but with the e-bike, Walking, can we start to like layer public space, um, you know, three-dimensionally? And um, so, this is now the last mile. We, you know, we've taken the route home. So, and because these mobility concepts they are shared and they are autonomous, so they don't have to be parked anywhere, because they are silent, because they're small, and because they are um, CO2 neutral, we can actually now really renegotiate these spaces for mobility and e-mobility, and really design neighborhoods uh, focused on people and not on these machines. So we arrive at home, we say goodbye to our next door neighbor, bye-bye. I -bye. Uh, hope it was a fun ride. <laughs> so, but when we go to sleep, you know, and, and rest, I mean, these these kind of, you know, think of them as robots. They can do other jobs for us during, during we sleeping. They, they could actually, you know, deliver parcels around uh, the city during night. Um, and this is how I hope in the future we will at some point have these kind of you know, mobility concepts that are seamless, three-dimensionally, and like kind of um, uh, on demand, basically. So how can, I want to now, you know, explain a little bit how we think that these, these mobility concepts will translate into, ur into the urban environment. And we call this the urban shelf. And this is, um, as we think of urban environments right now, um, the streets on the bottom and then the, you know, the privatized space into the set axis. And we actually want to think of this in as an inverted concept. So from before we start 
duplicating, multiplying pub privatized space, we want to now first start with the multiplication of public space. And actually, instead of like, you know, designing uh, kind of objects, we want to design basically holes. So from, you know, uh, these plates could be designed f through the movement of people, the flow of people, through the flow of air, uh, and through the flow of uh, light. Um, this kind of, you know, how this urban shelf, these layers could be then designed basically. And, you know, the, ba the basic elements would be structure, to hold it up, of course, uh, the platforms, the floors and the ceilings, um, the circulation for whatever mobility concept would be, and then, of course, the built-in units for housing and for commercial purposes and so on. Uh. <laughs> Somebody recognizes this? Um, I think it's, you know, it, for me it was a very, you know, important moment yesterday actually to, 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 to go and visit. Uh, and uh, I think we, we did this sketch as a little provocation for you guys because I think, you know, look, uh, don't be mad at us, yeah? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, think of it as, you know, as a structural spatial, you know, condition, not as a shopping center or, or com community shopping center, but it could also be for living, uh, could be, maybe. And we discussed about this yesterday. <laughs> There's a <the> proof. <laughs> Amata's sitting right there. <laughs> uh, we discussed about how, how big could this be scaled up? What if we include living there and, uh, and not just you know, you know, commercial units and functions? Um, and could this be, you know, we think of this more as you know, neighborhood scale, not just the building scale, but how big should it become actually? How, could, how, could, how big could we scale it up? Um, Facebook average, 383 people. It was a neighborhood maybe design, you know, the four blocks in, in Barcelona, around 5,000 people. So, I don't know, somewhere between 500 and 2,000 people, maybe as a, as a neighborhood design, as a size. Um, and I think that's for us a really important slide to say, you know, on one hand we have architecture design, the things about buildings, um, and that is driven by private interests, an investor, a client, and so on. And on the other side we have urban design, which is really driven by the public uh, kind of sphere, and it's about negotiation of, of different um, kind of needs and, and, and desires, but I think we really have to think about the scale in between, between architecture and urban design. I think neighborhood is like really, we should teach that at school. I think that's really an important scale that we have to focus more on about like, you know, neighborhood because it's, it, 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 it highlights the, the aspect of the community because the, the urban design is just is simply too big to, fo to, to scope with that and architecture is too small to, to realize that. So I think we need that third kind of, you know, scale in between. And that's, we say it could be, you know, driven by these mobility concepts, it doesn't have to be, but I think, you know, that's as a starting point, that's how we see it. This is one example of this neighborhood, more maybe stacked on top of each other. Um, a structural system of a building, so far the elevator core helps to hold the, 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 the structure up. We say split it, so we actually can use floor plates that are mostly carrying themselves. They're so heavy to carry themselves. So, but now they actually can help span in between those cores. They're part of the structural system. It works. We proved. <laughs> no, but the idea really is minimal footprint of these structures, maximum kind of you know, uh, um, space on the top. Um, and this is how this kind of neighborhood could be look like. So instead of putting a facade, it's not a tower. This is more like, you know, three-dimensional neighborhoods, little units inside, and you can actually have these local connections. Of course, this is very high, so you would need some kind of elevator, but you have, of course, the local connection uh, in between. And then also, this is more like master planning on a, on a floor plan, not designing the floor plan, like here's the kitchen, here's the entrance, but to say like, you know, this is units that actually can have a zoning we, 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 de we describe, and that can actually, these units can, they can also grow maybe. Uh, as families grow, these units could grow, uh, not static thinking of, of, of in, in, uh, uh, flats, but think of rooms that need to be added to. Yeah, this is 
how it could look like. And then, you know, these streets, yeah, right? Streets, I mean, hmm, <laughs> Hong Kong. There's actually, uh, you know, the last space that's left in Hong Kong is, is street space. So why do we, you know, why do we drive in the sun with cars? Let's, you know, let's put some urban shelf on top of it. This could, this would how it looked like. And, you know, again, the idea of a community, public space, people meet, com you know, I learned in the comments that 50% is circulation space. And, you know, why can we scale this up? Like, let's give space to circulation. That's important. Let's make people meet each other. That's the Berlin ver uh, version, less fancy, a little bit more affordable maybe. But I think that's also important to say different, um, different incomes could be, you know, could be individually kind of located into those structures as well. So it doesn't have to be only, you know, affordable maybe, but also you could, you could have your villa on the roof, like, which is like very kind of fancy. So like really an integrated kind of neighborhood concept. And then have these shared spaces maybe also to open up different parts of the flat to temporarily kind of, you know, share it out with, uh, with you, when your mobile phone becomes a key to a door, you can actually give local, like temporary access to uh, functions you don't need at home. Or like also not just living, but really like, you know, production. Think about 3D printing. Why, why do we need industrial areas? We can really bring those, you know, production cycles more together and closer together now. And then we did, you know, like if you think about the living unit inside of those structures, that's a very extreme uh, for one person uh, mini apartment. Um, mini, yes, we worked on a um, with a South German car manufacturer on that. I'm not allowed to tell the name, but um, uh, the idea was to say like let's let's shrink it down to maybe 30 square meters per person or two person and have a like, more kind of a public shared area and a more private zone to the back. But then maybe open it up to say, how could this unit talk to our neighbors? And you know, like this idea of a, you know, a, f a, f a foldable structure that could open up and like uh, combine uh, functional uh, kind of moments with your neighbors uh, temporarily as well. And another um, um, site you could say for for these mini apartments could be could be street spaces uh, in Berlin. We calculated that we have around 5.7 million of you know potential space in the city. That that equals to 100 almost 200,000 people who could live in this area. Um, so if we think about densification of our cities, like the cities which are there already, so you know activating that parking space once we don't need to park anymore because we ride shared and autonomous, um, then we can you know turn those sites and very extreme site condition but to say like uh, you know design around them like uh, kind of uh, living units that could be also you know connected to each other could grow um, and to say like this is idea of a kind of a new neighborhood that you know starts to grow within an old neighborhood I also have like a like a community kitchen maybe on the ground floor and then living on top as well but then it's like the the sides are maybe more closed, and like the, it's opened up more to the length of the street, so it also gives you privacy and the idea of light. So you know, really design, designed around those those streetscapes, basically. And so, I mean, this really tries to sum up basically what we what we want to achieve, like you know, interconnected neighborhoods. So again, like not just architecture, not urban design in the other extreme, but really have this kind of neighborhoods that are then interconnected, subways and so on. Flying buses. Somebody wants to talk about flying buses with us now. But uh, then we, I mean, um, so we have the chance and to, to to take these ideas and concepts and you know go to talk to other people. We even went to, we had the chance to to work with students in Brazil uh, on this urban shelf idea um, uh, at a conference in Rio, and then we we went to the Moho de Providencia. And now it becomes a bit, you know, now that was maybe more kind of. Uh, very kind of utopian and now we try to really bring it down to reality like as I said in the beginning now it's now it, be, it tries to become more realistically and uh, yeah learning from Rio that was an interesting kind of uh, time we had there to say this shelf is actually an interesting um, concept to, to combine top, top down strategies with a bottom up kind of movement so people 
could, as in a favela, build their own structures, one story, two stories maybe, but, um, but um, in, into that shell. So it's kind of an organized, like cleaned up favela condition almost. Um, and that was the idea really about participation. So people, you know, if you, if you in integrate them in the planning, in the construction of the neighborhood, they identify with that space. And I think that's also something we should, you know, in the, in the highly uh, industrialized, you know, building process, we should not forget, like, how can we actually use low tech to, to activate people's participation? And then, um, of course, this strategy, and as we in Germany had 2015 so many Syrian refugees coming, there was a big discussion starting about housing. Um, how do we want to, we have a housing crisis already in Germany, and this, this almost one million refugees from Syria uh, just you know, added to that, basically. And it was actually, for the architectural community, a very kind of a interesting moment because there was discussion going on, coming up again about like affordable but high quality housing. And so we also um, try to participate in that with, with the idea of this urban shelf and the low tech construction. Um, and we talked to people uh, in, who did reconstruction in Syria and they told us basically we, we don't have anything but clay that's the only you know, material they basically have. If I go back, you know, these structures are, most of these buildings, or some of them buildings, are structurally still intact, but the facade was, was uh, kind of falling in from, from, the, from the detonation wave, uh, but the structure is still intact. So it's about really facade construction. So this is actually, we could argue that that's a shelf as well. People have to finish the, the kind of the facade. And that's what we're now implementing in south of Germany, um, uh, and starting construction uh, this summer, and I'm really happy that we uh, get to this moment now that we say this tubing urban shelf, basically. On the very left, you see the, the basic framework, the, 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 the flooring, much smaller scale, as I promised in the beginning. Uh, but the circulation uh, is, is part of its structure, infrastructure. And then, with the help of refugees, we want to you know, install the facade uh, with rammed earth stones, um, this clay material. Um, and they are actually quite easy to produce. That was important to say, like, it's really uh, do-it-yourself um, construction method, um, but still doesn't look like, you know, it has an aesthetic kind of, you know, uh, kind of importance of this rammed earth walls, which are extremely beautiful as a, as a, uh, if it becomes a, if it's a whole wall, basically. And with these stones, they're almost 50 centimeter long, we actually can kind of, you know, come closer to this kind of uh, aesthetic, basically. So this shows the process, the, the shelf structure, then the fitting out uh, of the exterior facade uh, with clay, and then this is how it will look now uh, at the end. With a, and we're building, start building this now with a, with a um, local, you know, housing um, um, uh, development or company, basically, Kreisbau, tubing. And, and again, mobility, even if it's just you know walking, but it's like it's still a design driver. Like you know, fire regulations made us even add more stairs, which I think at the end <laughs> works out quite well. It's quite nice to have like you know this kind of you know like a landscape of of, of, of stairs cases basically. So this is like an intermix. We start with refugees. We have student apartments on the top. We have a roof garden for the neighborhood, like a workshop at the ground floor, and more refugees. And then these. Units, um, so again, like the ideas that we had from the urban shelf, like, you know, from private to public, do we say we live through these units are actually, you know, you know, we have a north orientation and a south orientation. So you sleep to the silent north, uh, and then you have this bathroom as a kind of natural kind of blocker between the more private functions and the more public functions towards the, the balcony access to the south. And then this balcony access is now not, not this kind of hallway, uh, that runs through, but it has these pockets always to, you know, to, to kind of give also, you know, to identify each, each unit, basically. And then this kind of landscape of, of staircases, you could take a probably a different way uh, home every, uh, every day, a different, a different path, basically. And then, of course, I think roof, the roofers have to be activated. We need to use them, and we will. Um, so 
these are the you know just quick floor plans showing that like there's highly regulations how much square meters exactly the the room has to have and and, and can be and so on because it will be turned into affordable housing uh, after we have it for refugees um, and this is the student apartments they look like super narrow but you know i think of them as more kind of two-faced kind of apartments one to the north and one to the south this is how it looked like yeah. And then, yeah, really the idea of like, if we, if we you know, this, uh, this community, the idea of like building together, like it also, you know, people identify with this, with their uh, built environment much stronger, I think. And really like, I mean, what we hope, but we, none, we don't know for sure, but I mean, it would be fantastic if just one of those people actually takes that knowledge back to Syria maybe and really, you know, distributes that thinking over there and like really helps con uh, to contribute to the reconstruction of that. And I think that, so we're working with, we have a Syrian refugee also, you know, who comes by to the office uh, and, and, and um, kind of helps us uh, developing this further and like testifying basically, or like testing if it's possible actually. And I think this, you know, we got really excited about clay um, somehow. Uh, it's such a beautiful material like it's the oldest of course the oldest uh, building material but uh, you know it can really contribute to a, you know like a circular city metabolism i think so from an excavation from preparation installation then recycling kind of you know uh, circular uh, kind of um yeah uh, metabolism basically uh, i think if we think of a bigger scale not just a small house and tubing but you know you know that's the berlin shelf version we want to work on now like you know scale this up basically i think it's a uh, it could really contribute to um, uh, to like an, a sustainable city growth because we are also we cannot afford to just build with concrete and steel i think we need you know we need different materials also not just also in the in the kind of dense urban environment so basically to sum up i mean to, when we we're questioned with the ban ban reconsidering dwelling. So for our approach would be to say, first of all, we need human scale mobility um, that leads to a kind of healthy densification, mixed neighborhoods that you know give identification. And you know, this idea of the urban shelf to say it's open for participation and different materials, and it's maybe adaptable to future needs, changeable. I think that's also something very important. And um, with having this said, I would say thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Max Chivitella, for such an inspiration talk. Now it's Q&A time. You can either uh, use a small paper and write out the question or use the microphone in the middle of aisle, or you can ask the microphone from our staff. You even can ask in Thai, and we have translator. And um, may I also invite uh, Rajapon Chu Shui, the moderator of the sessions, to go up on stage. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it, is, uh, it, it was extremely interesting projection of the future, I have to say. Um, Meanwhile, we're waiting for the questions from the floor. I would like to start. <laughs> Please. Um, actually, at the very beginning of your lecture, you mentioned um, the reference from 60. We all, I think many of us fell in love with, with those uh, very, in a way, utopian, dystopian movement of yeah. Archigram, Super Studio, or even the Metabolist. Mm -hmm. Um, from your presentation, I think it's very, in a way, utopia. And I love that. This is not uh, <laughs> a negative comment. <laughs> Could you actually um, elaborate on this um, aspect, how you relate yourself to this um, movement under 60, or how you see yourself in relation to that, different, uh, different uh, standpoints, or um, taking some inspiration? Well, all that. Yeah, uh, I mean, first of all, I mean, the six are like heroes, yeah. So, of course, I mean, of course. So we don't want to relate to them. We just <laughs> like we want to be inspired by them. That's how we we uh, think. And I mean, as I tried to you know explain with the slide about you know 
showing the pop world population at that time, I think they didn't. They were far ahead of their time because I think mm -hmm. they were there. There was no need to think like they thought at that time because you know urban environments were not so uh, didn't have that pressure as we have them today. Um, that's one thing. So there was not the, the massive need to think like this. And the other thing is there was not the technology um, that could could help to translate these structures or you know build these structures, circulate through these structures and so on. Um, if you think you know, like uh, uh, Constant uh, was one of the first ones, he, he talked about the homo ludens who was like, you know, this I mean, free-floating, uh, you know, somebody who like who gets paid for 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 having a good time. I mean, the Instagram <laughs> kids today, of course. they are exactly what he was describing, basically. Uh -huh. And so, so I think, you know, I, for me, the sixties are uh, more relevant, or they actually turn into reality. We just as architects uh, maybe. You mean after fifty years? Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, so I think like, you know, the need was not there to think of this and the technology was not there. So that's why also maybe it just, you know, was it uh, happened to be in books, basically. And that was it. Basically. Paper architecture. Paper architecture, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it's, it's more like inspiration. Yes. Like they're, they, they were ahead of their moment. I, yeah, I also think like, it, of course, it maybe it's it turned my view sometimes too big, um, but um, they, they are inspiration. And if we, if we try to, you know, make it a bit more graspable, maybe a bit more kind of controllable. I think there should be, I mean, they should be built. I think we should start building like that. Mm -hmm. You know, support structures, infill, all these concepts that, you know, that were there already. Like, we should really start with them again. To continue what we discussed last night uh, as an introduction, yeah. um, we have to say that, uh, in a way, you, you work as an architect, but on the other hand, it's not. So how do you see yourself on this uh, standpoint? Well, I I was I was before I, before we started the studio I was uh -huh. I was very an architect. <laughs> was, uh, <laughs> too like, much too too architect. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like like working on you know commercial projects and like um, um, and so I thought then at some point like well, how, how do you contribute to you know, what, mm. what's happening out there? And as an architect, like what do you mean how to contribute out there as an architect? Yes. Can like, you elaborate on this? A little yes. Bit? Yeah. Like what? I mean, uh, what is? It, I mean, by is it is it a beautiful facade? Is nice shapes? I think it's like oh, like I got so bored of that basically, and um, and it's like okay, what do we? How can we open up our like discipline and like you know start to talk to mobility providers because I realized well, they are shaping our cities. Audi and, and BMW is shaping our cities, not architects and urban designers. So. That's why I thought like we have to, you know, start talking to those people, and you know, take responsibility as architects and urban designers and say, well, approach them, go to them, you know, even, you know, of course, I mean, if I would knock Schindler's door and they would be like, what the hell do you want here? Like, who are you? Like, <laughs> as an architect. As an architect, and it's like, well, you know, I, I think I want to, want to, you know, share some thoughts with you guys, and, the, and then they, you know, I knocked again and again, so I, you know, search for your, your, your kind of the collaborators, maybe the ones you hate the most, maybe that's the one you should approach, maybe. Or so you hate Elevator No, 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 I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not, not, I don't hate them, it's not at all. They really, like, we, we have, we're talking in Schindler with the, with the, with the kind of the, the innovation uh, department. They're like, you know, it's, it's really amazing what they are open for. They think totally beyond the elevator. Like, they think in uh, circulation flows, people flows, and they always, they taught me one thing, make people happy. Don't think about money. Don't think about uh, stuff. To think about and make people happy. That's the that's the main goal, basically. So I'm think I'm saying this: the what you what you what you th what you see as a problem, as the elevator and the car is a problem. Mm -hmm. Try to talk to those and say like, well, how can we turn it into a solution, basically, or how can we start to modify it or you know. But you still see yourself as an architect in this way. I want. I will. I mean, like we have been now. Let's say for four years, we we're doing conceptual work and uh -huh. research. And um, if you define an architect who, who is somebody who builds actually stuff, uh -huh. then I can say, well, in, if I come back in one year, hopefully, then I could tell you then, yes, we, we, I can show you a picture of something being built. So I, I totally want to become back an architect in that sense. Uh, the, the, the reason I am, I, I'm yeah. asking this question is that because the, your standpoint is quite interesting, because it's, it's between like buildings. You, you, you mentioned in the mm -hmm. lecture, like 
between buildings and urban design. And I would add also technology yeah. because you, you discuss a lot of how technology would change uh, our, our city, our uh, living environment, yeah. and, and also the way we live. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, I think you, you touch a lot of uh, very important issues that sometimes as an architect, we take it for granted that we, we, have, to, we have to bring cars in, we have to have elevators to, to go up. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm asking, yeah. how do you see yourself? Okay, for example, with the tubing project, the last one for the refugees, well, Schindler, you know, we thought, okay, should we, should we put in an elevator? I was like, don't, please don't. I mean, it's four levels. Four levels, no need. No need, <laughs> first of all. But also then, you know, the, the, we also have to have a car park because of the regulations. They say, well, you have so many flats, that means you need to have uh, so and so many car parks. And we said, okay, um, but at least, you know, don't design a car park just for cars. You know, think of, you know, the floor can be, you know, tiles, not a concrete slab that is never changeable. So let's have it minimal height for, for cars right now, but have the floor being modif you know, changeable and like you can dig it out again and turn it into living maybe later if we don't need the cars anymore. So you can, you know, change the, you know, the car park basically. You cut the walls in and we, the, the, the iron is like, you know, the, the, the reinforcement is put like this so you can actually cut the sides. So we as architects, we can actually, we can contribute to, and, uh, to this and say, well, you know, the technology of the future will change our you know square meters, our you know built environment, and we have to you know take it into our planning already today. I think. Me, come time, talk floor. Can I say any question from the floor or uh, questions uh, written in the paper? Yep. So, I, one of one of I think the most uh, influential architects would be, say, Lebius Woods, mm -hmm. right? who I would consider very much an architect, but built very, very little. Um, so I think, you know, most of the work that you showed, I think um, is a contribution even if nothing ever gets built, right? So I think, um, you know, even if maybe one person in here steals one of your ideas about urbanism, like that's a huge contribution. So I think, you know, the, the it's, you know, it's a misnomer, I think, or, um, you know, maybe a chip on our our shoulders as architects that we have to build something t in order to to uh, feel like we contribute. Yeah. Um, and if you've got a you know the, uh, an environment or a context in which you can receive funding to do this research, that's that's an amazing contribution, an yeah. amazing place. I mean, I think that's. Uh, I mean, at the beginning, there was like, you know, friends of mine, like, architects, like, so what are you doing now? Is this art? What should this be? Like, oh, didn't, okay. But I think, you know, let's don't take ourselves so serious. Like, if, yeah, and then you do some fun stuff in between, you know, and, but just, you know, and that's what I think, of course, you say, like, talk to people, show the images, start the conversation, talk to, I think, students. Students is the most important to talk to because, you know, I'm, I'm old already. I'm 37. I'm going to, I mean, maybe one, two, three more projects, but then I'll be dead. You, the students today, <laughs> they should, well, if we have that pace, you know, <laughs> we should speed up now. But I mean, the students today, they're shaping our, you know, we need to talk to them. That's why, you know, pointing out this idea of the neighborhood. Please, you know, look at the neighborhood community design. I think that's important. Um, and then, yeah, the funding, um, yeah, that's also an important maybe question. Like, how do you finance stuff like this? Do you look for clients? Do you take in competition? We did one competition in the, since four years now. And I know, look for, look for, your, look for your, your kind of case that you, like you have in your, within yourself. I think it should not be come from outside. It should be something you have, like something that's bothering you, something that's interesting you, something you get really excited about and say like, well, okay, so who do I need to approach for, to, to attack this issue? And I think this is something we as architects should become more proactively, and maybe that's you know the idea of the 60s again, where they really kind of be more kind of socially proactive, and like you know as art was shaping our society, and I think you know all this is long gone now. But we as, as architects really should maybe look for kind of hands-on kind of you know collaborators that are you know supporting our case maybe. Yeah, because I think I think the collaborators have made those projects of course, much more 
relevant of than course, if, yeah. if, if it was just a bunch of us architects sitting in a room imagining what life should be like. Exactly. So the minute you bring in these, these collaborators, yeah. you bring in Otis, you bring in Audi, like yeah. all of the, the project just becomes infinitely better. You know, for example, Schindler, so they take this stuff and they, you know, they do dome movies. You fly through that, you know, these, these places. It's crazy. I mean, like, it's really immersive. Like, we did this show in Hong Kong and so on. So you, you get access to, like, a whole different audience, of course, through these people. And this is amazing. Um, sometimes also it takes forever. I mean, the, the Audi thing, like, it was 2014. Like, it's three years old. But I was in, in the U.S. two weeks ago and, like, talking to Volkswagen. And... Let's see, maybe, you know, if we find the right, you know, environment, we start to do like a little prototype of that flywheel. And so, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's be not as architects, well, this is my kind of, you know, my discipline, don't, don't, you know, it's like, talk to people, maybe start design a car, or like, why not? But let's make our hands dirty, basically. <laughs> yeah. Um, y your images were, were incredibly uh, mind-opening. Um, it's great. Um, but the slide that really hit home to me and made me see your work in a different way was what you did with PB Amata's Commons. It, it made it real because uh, your big ideas were collaged with all these messy elements that made it real for me as a person in Asia and Bangkok. So I think there's, even, even though I love the original building, it's one of my favorite buildings, Lak <laughs> Bibina. I love the commons, I go there every week, but seeing your collage made me see how great that building is because it's, it's, op it's, it's an open building, it's a flexible yeah. building, and yeah. it was flexible for somebody who came halfway across the world and made you see something different. Yeah. So uh, that image was really important to me. I'd appreciate it that you came and you did that image for us. <laughs> it's I just a really comment. Scared. I was really scared about this image. Like, we talked with our friends. <laughs> but I was like, okay, that's you know, I'm, I'm just this German who can, you know, I even had a Buddha in there, like, and we said, like, let's take the Buddha out. It's like, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, like, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks, for, thanks that, that this is, uh, it, it wasn't, we not get beaten up for this or something. <laughs> like, we, we, like, uh, it, 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 it's appreciated. That's, that's good to hear. That's cool. Um, I come from Sri Lanka, which is a developing country. And we have a, I mean, I think your presentation about the future is very, very good, and I have no problem with that. But one of the things we find is that when a villager does his house with mud, it's very cheap. But when you try to do the same thing in an urban city, it is 10 times the price of a normal building, because you have to bring the mud to the city, then cast it in the city, and do that. So. Though those may be romantic ideas, it may be cheaper to build in a normal terms than to use what a villager uses into the city. Do you have any comment on that? Um, I mean, the fact that it's, 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 uh, it's not, or it's cheaper, or it's more expensive to build in the city, for, I realize it's first of all more expensive in the, you know, in the Europe context. Labor is so expensive, you, you know, that's the main issue. So looking at it from this perspective, um, I think that um, yes, it, the, the first installation cost might be a bit higher, but they're actually representing the real cost, including CO2 kind of emissions later on, long, long term, recycling costs and so on. So maybe at the beginning it's a bit higher, but I think you know, you know, looking at a long term basically, I think it pays off. Um, Hopefully, but I think um, most important is we. I mean, there's these these studies that we just cannot keep on going building in steel, glass, uh, and concrete the way we do it. We can't just you know the resources are not there anymore. We need to have also for the urban environment. And we did even like one collage. It's like a, the first clay tower in New York. I mean, why not? Why uh, like we have to uh, and. Uh, yeah, in Tübingen, it's, even though it's, it's at the edge of the city, we, we hope to actually use the excavation as well, partly for the clay, not given yet, but, uh, but we hope to produce the mud or the stones partly on site, not everything outside, but you know, on site as well. 
And um, yeah, I mean the transportation cost, like the less, the, the the lower or the the, the less the, the the distance is, of course, the cheaper it is. So, but I mean clay is is something that's everywhere around the world and mostly for free. And this is uh, this gives me hope that this could also work in urban environments. Yeah. Is there any other questions from the floor? Actually, the my screen is already red. It means that we are kind of time up. <laughs> yeah, we are already <laughs> over time. But if there is any question, we can uh, stand for one more question. Okay, I, uh, um, just my question because um, you you emphasize a lot this um, representation, the image. Yeah. As an architect, you I I believe you you think that is very crucial because you talk about that particular. Photoshop image that you spend like two months, yeah. <laughs> right? Like to, to doing that. Yeah. So, um, and especially um, you mentioned many times that uh, it is still a kind of um, research project and it could be like, it's projecting the future. Can you elaborate on this issue of representation that you, you uh, give a lot of energies yeah. into it? So, all of these images are, you know, we produce them in-house. So normally you, you, you design a building, you, you go to the render company, you say, like, give me four images, you know, uh, bring me back. So we're producing all of them images in-house. Sergei uh, is a traditional uh, paper architect, he calls himself. He's, he's uh, coming from the Ukraine. He's doing all these images, basically. He's a Photoshop artist, right? <laughs> I mean, that's incredible what, he, what he's doing. And, yeah, and like, uh, like he, he, he's been our first collaborator, actually. He's the very first person who, who worked with me on, on, these st on these stuff. And uh, I mean, images are, f f yeah, as I said, architecture takes forever. Uh, it's so expensive. You know, let's, let's, let's try start to kind of, you know, the discussion through images. And of course, also what's interesting about images, like you can misinterpretate them and people see different things in them and that leads to uh, misunderstandings that might come to a different solution or something. So even better. Uh, even better, exactly. Yeah. So, so, uh, so, for I think we should like they are a great tool. I mean, we we as architects we specializing economic social problems, and because you know we as humans are spatial, we can relate to them, and we can you know we can you know explain these kind of abstract problems sometimes in a very kind of spatial way, and I think that makes them so. Uh, we can, you know, relate to them so easily. So that's how you see the importance of images. Yes. Okay, so I think um, if there's no more question, I would like to conclude um, um, the session uh, of Max Switala here. And thank you very much for thank your you much. wonderful uh, talk and uh, projection to our future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Switella and Sandra Chapon. Now I'd like to ask Dr. Chapon to um, give the token of appreciation to our speakers.ค่ะก็ขอขอบคุณมากนะคะแล้วก็จะขออนุญาตประชาสัมพันธ์ข่าวสารของสมาคมประชาธิปไตยสามารถดูข้อมูลเพิ่มเติมได้ที่อาสาเว็บไซต์และอีเมลที่ขึ้นไว้บนจอหน้าขณะนี้นะคะโดยมีขั้นตอนการส่งข้อมูลคือถ่
นะคะที่จะประกอบไปด้วยหลายกิจกรรมเลยก็ประกอบไปด้วยการจัดนิทรรศการนะคะการอบรมเชิงปฏิบัติการระยะสั้นและการเสวนาเชิงวิชาชีพและวิชาการโดยจะมีสถาปนิกจากคาร์โลเด็กผู้ออกแบบสถานทูตออสเตรียมาบรรยายในวันที่14มิถุนายนนี้และจะจัดเวิร์กช็อประหว่างวันที่17มิถุนายนถึง30กรกฎาคมซึ่งผู้สนใจสามารถส่งพอร์ตเฟลโอได้โดยตรงที่ v i e n n a a t h a l o d e x a r c h i t e c t c o m ที่ขึ้นอยู่บนหน้าจอนะคะหรือจะขอดูรายละเอียดเพิ่มเติมได้ที่อาสาเว็บไซต์ค่ะสำหรับท่านผู้ที่ทำการลงทะเบียนในออนไลน์แล้วช่วยกรุณาแสดง QR code ในเซสชันต่อไปที่เจ้าหน้าที่ด้วยนะคะ uh, Thank you very much We will resume at 4 p.m. for our last sessions of the lecture Thank you Thank you <laughs>